science of linguistics is a unique contribution of India. You see, India has, of course, also played a pioneering role in mathematics, in astronomy, and other sciences. But in linguistics, it has done more than that. It is alone in the world in starting the science of linguistics. And so when in Europe, their own version of linguistics as a science started in the 19th century, it was after and because of the discovery of Sanskrit linguistics. At that very time, I was sitting in the audience and while listening with a half ear, I was also doing my email correspondence. And so I received an email. I was in a, in a bit of a correspondence with one of the top Indo-Europeanists, Hans Heinrich Hock, a German teacher in America. And so he said, but, but Dr. Elst, you are an intelligent man. How can you be swayed by all these fanatical, silly Hindu nationalists? Now, you see, I was sitting there, not with some silly Twitter trolls, but with the top professors, you see, who are of equal academic rank as this uh, Professor Hock, saying exactly the opposite. They said, no, no our innovation. From, from my own profession, you see, I am aware of the evidence that could, you know, favor or disfavor uh, an R in invasion. Well, I see nothing of an R in invasion. Then the second nail in the coffin of the Out of India theory was the incoming new translations of the Rig Veda. You see, because of this, the sphere of the times, the zeitgeist, they start interpreting all these things in racial terms. So everywhere where you have the word black applied to the enemy, they say, ah, that's the black skin color. In fact, you see the word black is very commonly in many languages used to indicate the enemy. Why many Western Indo-Europeanists find it bizarre that in India people are so worked up about this homeland question. Because you see, in the West, nobody cares anymore. In the 19th century, yes, the, the, the homeland thing was a big thing. Now, not anymore. And so that it is still in India, that's not understood. And so that's mainly because they don't understand the political uses that are made of the Aryan theory here by the Dravidianists, by the Ambedkarites, by the Christian. So ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about the Aryan debate, the so-called Aryan debate. You might know about the Indo-European language family, which includes the lang most languages of Europe, of uh, Russia and Iran, and of North India. So, um, is the largest language family in the world, or at least the one spoken by most people. And they're all daughters of a um, ancestor language that should have been spoken some 6,000 years ago, which is um, with approximation reconstructed by the comparative historical linguistic method and um, it's not liked by many Hindu nationalists because it cuts through borders. It doesn't confirm India's unity. No, it unites a large part of Indian languages with European languages and it separates them from another part of the Indian languages. So. Sanskrit is cognate with Latin. It's not cognate with Tamil, but it has influenced Tamil, which is something else. So I, uh, I refer to an article by Srikantalageri where he affirms the kinship of these languages. 
You see, if I say so myself, Hindu chauvinists will say, yeah, but you're a foreigner and you don't understand and you're biased and imperialist and so on. So, okay, I leave it to a fellow Indian to convince you that Sanskrit really is cognate to Latin and really is not cognate to Tamil, although it has influenced Tamil. Um, so you, what you do have in India is a linguistic area where people that, or languages that are not cognate nevertheless grow together, converge, develop a similar language pattern, a sentence pattern. That's called the linguistic area. And so in that sense, the Dravidian or South Indian languages have come to resemble the North Indian languages. The um, science of linguistics is a unique contribution of India. You see, India has, of course, also played a pioneering role in mathematics, in astronomy, and other sciences. But in linguistics, it has done more than that. It's alone in the world in starting the science of religion, uh, of, of, of linguistics. So again, it is alone in the world in starting the science of linguistics. And so when in Europe, their own version of linguistics as a science started in the 19th century, it was after and because of the discovery of Sanskrit linguistics. One thing you can see of the scientific approach, like every day, is the alphabet used in Sanskrit, in Hindi, and so on, as also in the Dravidian languages, uh, namely the, the, the phonetic organization of the sounds in the uh, Devanagari alphabet, which also is used in all the all the borrowed, all the related alphabets in Tibetan, in many Southeast Asian languages and so on. Even in Karoshti, which was a, a language or an alphabet, a writing system borrowed from Aramaic, which is a Semitic language, which has a writing system of its own. So the shape of the letters is clearly borrowed from, uh, from Semitic, from Aramaic, but the ordering of the letters within this alphabet follows the Sanskrit pattern. And so it's very scientific. That's why when the Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev developed his periodic system of the elements, he was inspired by the order of the Sanskrit alphabet. So Indians ought to be proud of linguistics rather than disparaging it as a a racist, colonialist concoction, a ghost language, and so on. That's what they say about this Proto-Indo-European that is painstakingly being reconstructed by the Indo-Europeanists. So it all started in 1767 when a French Jesuit, Gaston Laurent Coeur d'Eau, sent a paper to the Academy in Paris arguing that Latin and Greek were related to Sanskrit. Uh, sometime a few years later, the word Aryan was introduced, at least in French, Aryan, um, but with the meaning of Indo-Aryan, because he didn't find this uh, Abraham Hyacinthe Anquetil du Perron who is sometimes called the father of Orientalism, he didn't find the word Arya except in the Indian and Iranian languages. Uh, however, later, the German uh, scholar and India lover Friedrich Schlegel, 1808, uh, thought that all the Indo-European languages had had some cognate of the word Arya, and so he used the word Aryan as a synonym for Indo-European. And so throughout the 19th century and until 1945, this remained customary to replace the word Indo-European with Aryan.
The um, first idea of a homeland logically pointed to India because it is the discovery of Sanskrit that led to the realization that these languages were related. And Sanskrit was also obviously older than Latin and Greek. Like uh, it had eight cases of the noun rather than uh, six in Latin or five in Greek or four in German. And it had three numbers rather than two. It had a singular and a plural, but also a dual. And so in Latin, Greek, and the other languages, you see remnants of this third number, or you see remnants of the disappeared cases, the instrumental case and the locative case. Like in Latin, you have a form domi from domus. Domus means house. Domi is a non-existent locative in Latin, which in the case of this word has been preserved. And so it means at home. So you see the remnants of these cases. So it's clearly not that Sanskrit has developed them later when they weren't originally there. No, on the contrary, Sanskrit had preserved them while Greek and Latin had lost them. So Greek and Latin were clearly younger. And so they thought that the country of Sanskrit, India, was the land of origin. So that was the out of India theory, which was the dominant theory in Europe, developed not by Hindu nationalists, but by Europeans. And that remained in vogue till about 1840. So the first 70 years of the language family's existence, it was assumed to be from India. It um, will come to how it disappeared in the 19th century. But so it was revived from 1982 onwards when in his book Karpasa, which means cotton in Sanskrit, K.D. Setna argued that cotton was clearly present in the Harappan cities, but it was not yet present in the Rig Veda from which he concluded that the Rig Veda was older than the Harappan cities, which start to flourish around the 2600 BC. So he locates the uh, Rig Veda even earlier. Then in 1984, you had an American archeologist who argues that, you know, how much we dig, we never find any sign in the whole Harappan area of any invasion at all. Not a military invasion, but not a peaceful invasion either. Uh, the term out of India theory was coined uh, about 1997 by Edwin Bryant, an American scholar. So uh, scholarship uh, of the Indo-European languages was born in 1816 with the work of Franz Bob, who compared the conjugation system in Sanskrit with that of Latin and Greek. And so that's when the start is of the reconstruction of the so far unattested hypothetical language of Proto-Indo-European. In 1834, it is August Schlegel, who happens to be the brother of Friedrich Schlegel, who had glorified India and put India in the center. Here he does, this August does just the opposite. He says the homeland was not in India. It was in or near the Caucasus mountains. That's essentially what has remained. So the, the, the putative homeland has you know, journeyed a little bit, but essentially all around this Caucasus area. And so now the favorite is the so-called Yamnaya culture, the pit grave culture, which was in Ukraine and Russia. Initially, this Aryan invasion theory, well, it's Aryan invasion because if it puts the homeland outside India, then it only have come into India by invading into India. 
so from the Indian vantage point, you call it Aryan invasion theory. So, um, or Aryan immigration theory. Now, some Europeans, and especially those located in India, who saw and, and breathed every day the magnitude and the importance of India, they countered this new theory. They swear by the out of India theory. They were not Hindu nationalists, they were Europeans, but located in India. And so the most important one will surprise you. You see, many Indians say, oh, the Aryan invasion theory is colonialist and racist, blah, 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 concocted, and so on. Well, actually, the great defender of the out of India theory was Mount Stuart Elphinstone. He was a colonialist par excellence. He had been the governor of Bombay presidency. And so after his retirement, he became a historian, wrote an important history of India. And so in the beginning, he talks about this, this new idea of an Aryan invasion. And he argues, it is opposed to their foreign origin that neither in the Code of Manu nor in the Vedas, nor in any book uh, certainly older than the Manu's Code, is there any allusion to a prior residence. The question, therefore, is still open. There is no reason whatever for thinking that the Hindus ever inhabited any country except their present. So that's still one of the main arguments for the out of India theory. Now, of course, um, many people by then had become used to the idea of a homeland that lies just in the middle. You see, between Sri Lanka, where you have Indo-European Singhalese, and the Maladives also, Maladivi is also an Indo-European language. So between that and Iceland, or between Assam and uh, Portugal, uh, this, this Yamna culture lies more or less in the middle. And so it seems that they symmetrically migrated both to the east and the west. And indeed, you see, I have verified in a number of Indo-European conferences that, you see, most backbenchers think that that is a very decisive argument in favor of the Yamna homeland. Now, in fact, if you think twice, it's not. Most languages that spread over a large territory do not so from the middle, but from one extreme. You see, if Russian had started in the middle, it would be, you know, originated in, in Novo Sibirsk or Irkutsk or thereabouts. No, it has started in Kiev, which is now Ukraine, even to the west of Russia, and spread all the way east to Alaska. And it has not spread to the west at all. You have Arabic that spread from Arabia all the way to Morocco, to the west, and not to the east at all. You have the Bantu languages in Africa. They originated in West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, thereabouts. They did not go north, but they went all the way south to the Cape. In fact, you see, they were so successful because they were the first in Africa to practice agriculture, which is good for food production and for control of your access to food. So it's good for increasing the population, and so the population kept on expanding. Now, they didn't go north. Why not? Well, to the north, you have the Sahara Desert. You can't practice agriculture there. Whereas to the south, you see, you have patches of land that can serve. And so they kept on going south till they couldn't go any farther. So the reasons why people migrate are not symmetrical. And therefore, migrations are not symmetrical. So you see, in this case, when I propose that they went from India all the way to Iceland and Ireland and Portugal, that's not so unreasonable. In this case, it should also be noted that the recent development, a hopeful development, 
among Indo-Europeanists is that they realized that the Yamna homeland was only a secondary homeland. So people like, uh, like um, uh, Paul Haggerty, one of the top linguists, uh, favor Anatolia as the original homeland from where the settlement in Ukraine created only a secondary homeland. The geneticist David Reich thinks that northern Iran was the homeland from where they went to um, the Yamna place and then farther. Um, so, you see, in spite of these arguments that I am now voicing, the Aryan invasion theory won through. And so, in 1926, there appeared a book by the Australian Gordon Childe called The Aryans, a study of Indo-European origin, where he first, yeah, let's say first, uh, voiced the growing consensus for Southwest Russia, for the Yamna culture as the land of origin. And so ever since, this has hardly changed. Another variety of the same thing is the idea of the Kurgan culture. Uh, Kurgans are artificial grave hills. And so they existed on the steppes, and there they entered Europe. Now, that European part is uncontroversial. The Indo-Europeanization of Europe came from the East. That's very short. So, from the European angle, you could say that Ukraine is the homeland. Except that the settlement of Indo-Europeans in Ukraine may again have originated elsewhere. But so that's a bit too far away, too invisible. But so the conquest of Europe, that's very obvious. And there we see an immense genetic revolution. The original people are almost replaced by the newcomers from the East. We see an enormous archaeological revolution, new pottery types, new burial types, new habitation types. So there you have all the signs of an Aryan invasion. And that's exactly what you don't find in India. That's why a few years ago I was at an archaeologist's conference in Delhi with all the top archaeologists from India. And all of them were coming to say, yeah, and I do digging in Raki Gari, and I've never seen a sign of the your, uh, Aryan invasion. And I do digging in Dola Vira, and I've never seen a sign of the Aryan invasion. Which was cute, because you see, at that very time, I was sitting in the audience, and while listening with a half ear, I was also doing my email correspondence. And so I received an email. I was in a, in a bit of a correspondence with one of the top Indo-Europeanists, Hans Heinrich Hock, German teaching in America. And so he said, but, but Dr. Elst, you are an intelligent man. How can you be swayed by all these fanatical, silly Hindu nationalists? Now, you see, I was sitting there not with some silly Twitter trolls, but with the top professors, you see, who are of equal academic rank as this uh, Professor Hock, saying exactly the opposite. They said, no, no Aryan invasion. From, from my own profession, you see, I am aware of the evidence that could you know, favor or disfavor uh, an Aryan invasion. Well, I see nothing of an Aryan invasion. All right, well, uh, nevertheless, that uh, hasn't cut ice so far. So that paradigm is essentially still dominant. In fact, one application, you see the Kurgans are grave hills. So you see one element that they use in support is that the Buddhist stupa is essentially also a grave hill, an artificial grave hill, you see, which, which has the shape of a mountain. And inside of it is, you know, not a dead body, but the ashes of a dead body or, or some relic, like the tooth of the Buddha or so. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, they, they try to make the best of it. So that, um, that uh, paradigm is still dominant. 
Now, I've been talking about Aryan invasion. In recent years, many scholars have protested against the use of the word invasion. You see, for their tender feelings, this is much too warlike. You see, too toxic masculine. Uh, so they think that there was no war, there was just a peaceful invasion, well, no, not <laughs> a peaceful immigration, an intrusion, an influx. Well, um, you see, that's not how it was originally seen. I mean, people are used to military conquest. Why do they speak Spanish in South America and English in North America? Well, because of conquest, because wars have been won. And, uh, you know, and that's like that all over the world. There's one scholar, a, f a fanatic of the Aryan invasion theory, Bernard Sergent. Um, so I once saw him at uh, louvain la neuve which is the, the French wing of my own home university. And there was a conference about Indo-European and so he gave a talk um, in which he mentioned that he had just read a review in a French paper of Michel Danino's book about the invasion that never was, or the French translation of it. And so this professor said, yeah, you know, I'm not going to read the book because it's obviously not true. You know, of course there was an Aryan invasion. Okay, so he's quite convinced of the Aryan invasion. Nevertheless, he insisted on saying, well, all those people who try to make it a peaceful immigration under the radar, you know, they are just unrealistic about how things go in history. So his parents both had been in the French resistance against the Nazi occupation. And so they knew all about war. And uh, so, you see, he mocked us a little. But nevertheless, he can do that, we cannot, you see, because you know, we are in the opposition, we are fighting an uphill battle. Um, nevertheless, you see, I think it was an invasion. Uh, first of all, many of these immigrationists implicitly do speak of an invasion like uh, Michael Witzel, whom you've certainly heard of. You see, he speaks about the horse and chariot that were brought into India by the Aryan invaders. And archaeologically, that's unlikely. We have already found uh, spoked-wheeled, horse-drawn chariots in Sinauli near Delhi, 2000 BC, much before the supposed Aryan invasion. But anyway, you see, he thought they had brought this invention, and he called it the panzer, the tank of the Aryans. So you see, what he's saying is they had a military advantage. That's why they won. So you see, scratch an immigrationist, and you'll find an invasionist. Um, but more fundamentally, you see, the word invasion does not refer to the means of conquest, but to the result. You see, if you uh, try to integrate into a country, you adopt the language, you adopt the religion, the customs, and so on, that you would call an immigration. But if you take over the country, if you impose your language, impose your religion, as is always said of the Aryans in India, that's called an invasion, whether you need a military conquest for that or not. So I say, yes, of course, it was an invasion, but, you know, I'm not going to fuss over it. If they want to call it an immigration, well, okay, an, an invasion is a particular case of an immigration, so let's call it that, you know, to keep them humored. Then you have the racialization. So in the mid-19th century, the new ideology of racism comes in. And um, uh, it is uh, Arthur de Gobineau in France in 1855 who starts using the term Aryan in a racial sense, the Aryan race. 
who also implies that it's non-Jewish. The, the Jews, even though white and so on, they're not Aryans, they're Semites, and the Aryans are the Indo-Europeans. And so they're white. And if in India they speak an Indo-European language, it is because the Aryan invaders have brought this and then they mixed. And so what you people are is a mix of the dark aboriginals with the white invaders. So from then on, you get ideas that the Aryans are blonde, blue-eyed, and so on, that they stem from Northern Europe. Now, there are two uh, nails in the coffin of the Out of India theory. So by the mid-19th century, the Out of India theory is, is off the table. And so that's mainly because of uh, linguistic paleontology is a new development. It means that from the vocabulary of an ancient language, you can deduce in what environment it flourished. Like Indo-European has no word for kangaroo or for giraffe or for jaguar, but it has words for bear, for wolf, for birch tree, so, you see, that seemed to point to Northern Europe. It also has a word for beech, which is a Western Europe, European tree. So it had to be like really inside Europe. Um, now, this is not entirely true. And indeed, Sri Kantalagiri uh, uses linguistic paleontology to make precisely the opposite case. You see, he points out that First of all, India has islands of cold climate, and there are bears and wolves and birch trees in India. Birch trees only in Kashmir, but still, the mountainous areas in India are islands of cold climate. Then, as for the hot climate, well, a typical hot climate animal is the elephant. And the word elephant, he shows, is very much an Indo-European word and it's present in many Indo-European languages. And yet, the only country in the whole expanse where Indo-European is spoken, where there are also elephants, is India. Then the second nail in the coffin of the Out of India theory was the incoming new translations of the Rig Veda. You see, because of this, the sphere of the times, the zeitgeist, they start interpreting all these things in racial terms. So everywhere where you have the word black applied to the enemy, they say, ah, that's the black skin color. In fact, you see the word black is very commonly in many languages used to indicate the enemy. Like for instance, in the Second World War, in British uh, army reports, when they talk about Subhas Chandra Bose, who was a collaborator with the Axis powers, who was in the enemy camp, he's systematically called a black. So that's not a skin color. Now in the Battle of the Ten Kings, that's, that's really the one that, that tills the scales. The Battle of the Ten Kings, Vasishta, the Vedic seer, describes himself as Shvitniya as white clad, which is interpreted as white complexioned, white skinned. Uh, and the enemies are, of course, the Asikni Visha, which seems to mean the black tribe. But Asikni, black, is actually the name of a river, the Black River which is a perfectly normal name of a river, like we have the Yellow River. Okay, so you have the Black River, the Thames in London, and in Oxford also means the Black River, with the word Thames, which is related to the Sanskrit word Tamas, which is another word for dark. So here you see the river is called Asikni. This is the Chenab River in present-day Pakistan, in West Punjab. And so the enemies are coming from there. You see, Sudas is awaiting them on the Parusni River, which now is the border between India and Pakistan. So actually, the Battle of the Ten Kings 
5,000 years ago, was the first Indo-Pak war. Won, of course, by the Indian side, as usual. And so, um, Sudas, King Sudas, the Vedi king, is coming from the Saraswati basin in Haryana. That's the center of Vedic culture. So he's conquering to the west. He has already conquered up to the Parusni river. The people to the west who are the Iranians, it's very clear from the story. They fear, you know, they, they, they get together. That's why you have the Battle of the Ten Kings. All these sub-tribes form an alliance. They want to defend themselves against Sudas, but they lose the battle. Um, and so they flee westwards. And that's why you have the Iranians in Afghanistan and in Iran and in Kurdistan. Uh, so they fled from India westwards. Um, that they are Iranian is very clear, and it's really a wonder of the world that no translator has noticed this. You know, they all say, ah, the Dasas and Dasyus, who are the enemies, you know, they are the black aboriginals. Now, first of all, the black aboriginals should have been encountered when the Aryans come from the west, they should have come from the east. But here you have just the opposite. It's the Vedic people who come from the east, the enemies who come from the west. Moreover, they have Iranian names of persons, Iranian names of the tribes, and there is also a description of the Iranian religion, which is recognizably Zoroastrianism. So it's not the black aboriginals, it's the fellow Aryan, you know, Iranians. Anyway, so this was all um, interpreted in racial terms. And so that was a mistake, but nevertheless, at that time, it won the day. So the uh, out of India theory was completely uh, chanceless at that time. Yet there were also voices against this racialization. Max Müller, Friedrich Max Müller. He has a bad name in India today, but he was, in fact, uh, quite meritorious. He was the editor of the series of translations, Sacred Books from the East, which in Europe was a cultural revolution. You see, in, in the 16th century, you had a revolution in the sense that they got acquainted again with the Greek and Hebrew uh, classics. This is called humanism, the, the Renaissance period. And so in the 19th century, you got the final acquaintance with the fabled wisdom of the Orient. And so that's to a large extent thanks to Max Müller. So he had a big name, he had big influence, and that is why everybody accepted his casual guesstimate that the Aryan invasion had taken place in 1500 BC. Actually, he had no proof for that. And indeed, other Orientalists at the time said so. And among them, his pupil, Moritz Winternitz, who argued, you see, it's impossible that this entire philosophical evolution from the beginning of the Rig Veda up to, let's say, the Buddha is comprised in such a few centuries. So he thought, you see, Rig Veda, third millennium, long before the Aryan invasion. And Max Müller threw his hands up in the air and said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, that was only a guess. That was not based on anything. And then he became pessimistic and he said, yeah, we'll never know when this actually happened. I think we're going to know, but I mean, okay, so he admitted that there was no proof for 1500 BC, but by that time, everybody had already accepted this date, and it has not been questioned till today. So when David Reich from Harvard uh, claimed that there had been an influx into India in a bit more than 1500 BC, like 1700 BC, then everybody, like in India, Tony Joseph, applauded, hey, the, finally the Aryan invasion theory is proven. Well, no. 
you see, people may have come into India, and why not? You see, later you have the uh, Scythians coming into India, the Huns, the Greeks, the Turks, and they all left their genes here, but they didn't leave their language here. They assimilated into the Indian culture. They took over the language, not always the religion. The Turks remain Muslims, but sometimes even the religion, like the Jats, are actually a Scythian sub-tribe, the Getai. So they become the Jats. They become fully Hindus. Or the Greeks who came here. You see, one of the Greek kings is Menander, or in Sanskrit, Melinda. He became a Buddhist. You know, for him, you have the book, the Melinda Panya, the questions to Menander. Or you have Heliodorus, who became a Krishna worshiper, and so on. So most people assimilated. So there is no reason to assume that these famous Aryan invaders did differently. Anyway, those who came in, uh, according to David Reich, they may have come. I have nothing against this genetic evidence, but they were certainly not the Aryans. They did not bring the Indo-European languages in the in into India. Why not? Because these were already in India since like 1500 years earlier. Then you have a politicization of the uh, Aryan theory. So this, this equation of race with language was pretty firm until the Second World War. Um, you had uh, the British colonial appropriation. So the British thought that this was an excellent justification for the occupation of India. They said, well, you see, conquering India is nothing new. The Aryans have also done it. The Hindus should not hold it against us because they themselves have done it. Then you get National Socialism in Germany. The main uh, race theorist there, Hans Günther, takes the Aryan invasion theory as the paradigm, the illustration of the National Socialist worldview. So actually, the Aryan invasion theory is the most politicized historical theory ever. <laughs> and in this connection, I could illustrate this with the example of Adolf Hitler. Um, so the National Socialists thought that the Aryan invasion theory was really the cornerstone of the racist worldview. First, you have the dynamic whites who subdued the indolent brown natives of India. Then they wisely imposed caste apartheid in order to preserve their race. Unfortunately, some race mix mixing took place anyway, so they became a bit less superior. But fortunately for them, they still had cousins who had pre preserved their race, who very fortunately for them came to colonize them and to provide them with good governance. Because they themselves, of course, were incapable of doing this, but fortunately the British, who are really German, uh, actually came to provide it. Hitler himself didn't speak much of India, but he did say, and I quote, we know that the Hindus in India are a people mixed from the lofty Aryan immigrants and the dark black Aboriginal po population, and that this people is bearing the consequences today. For it is also the slave people of a race that almost seems like a second Jewry. And in the mouth of Hitler, this comparison to the Jews was not meant as a compliment. Now, in Europe, this race talk has become very unfashionable after 1945, but in India, it is fully alive. In India, you had identification of some groups with the Aryan invaders, especially the Sikhs, who were very loyal to the British, uh, embraced this. And it so happens that the Sikhs physically also resemble to how the Vedic Rishis are depicted in, let's say, the Amar Chitra Katha. Uh, 
There were also the Singhalese in Sri Lanka who were surrounded by Dravidian speakers, so they also emphasized that they were Aryans. Conversely, of Jyoti Rao Pule, who identifies with the lower castes and emphasizes that they are the aboriginals who suffered the Aryan invasions. And you see this, this discourse exists still today with Malikarjuna Kharge shouting in parliament, you Aryans don't belong in India. Which is a very funny thing. You see, when you say to people, oh, you don't belong here because your ancestors were here for only 4,000 years. That doesn't count. You know, you try saying that in America. Um, so, I mean, there you have this, this ethnic politicization of the racial question, not by the out of India camp. This is entirely the doing of the Aryan invasion camp. Um, some people then uh, argued when Karge had said this, uh, yeah, the only indigenous people in India really are the Adivasis, by which they mean the tribals. Now, most people don't know where this word Adivasi comes from. They think, they assume that this is a Sanskrit word and that by itself it already proves that the ancient Hindus were aware that these tribals were Adivasis, were aboriginal inhabitants of India and therefore that they themselves were not, that they were invaders. No, you see this word Adivasi is a modern coinage. It's from around 1920. But it immediately conquered the whole discourse about them. And so it's, it's a very bright uh, invention. It is a one word disinformation campaign. Okay, so um, now we have genetics, the new kid in town. And um, so people think that this is going to prove anything. Uh, so I'm not so sure of it, because race and language are two different things. You see, why do they speak English in Australia? Well, because they descend from the British. Why do they speak English in Jamaica? Do the Jamaicans, who are mostly blacks, do they come from England? No. They came from Africa, but through historical circumstances, they adopted the English language. So such phenomena happen all the time. And uh, therefore, you can't identify a physical trait. You know, in the past, it was a skull measurements and nose measurements and so on. Now it is genes. But so you can't identify physical traits with the language. But then again, to some extent, it may be useful you know, you can't spread a language without a migration. Today, perhaps, people can take a, an internet course of Sanskrit and even though never coming to India, still learn Sanskrit. But in those days, the only way to bring a language here was to come here or to take it from here elsewhere was to go there. So to some extent, you see genetics as an importance. So David Reich claims that, you know, he found signs of an influx. Uh, there are uh, geneticists in India like Niraj Rai or Raj Vedam who deny this, who argue against it. But personally, not being a geneticist, I don't know and I don't mind. You see, people may have come in, but so many people have come in, so it, that doesn't prove anything. You see, they don't have to brought, have brought their own language. And anyway, they are too late for bringing Sanskrit because Sanskrit was already in India. And so there, is, there are a number of proofs for a higher chronology of the Vedas. And won't go into the details here, but there are now archaeological, archaeoastronomical, uh, literary, and even linguistic proofs for this much higher chronology of the Vedas. Mind you, 
uh, many Hindus at the time accepted the Aryan invasion theory. You see, it had a bright side in the sense that they had something in common with the British rulers. So it strengthened the idea, yeah, we also have a right to rule. You know, we don't need anyone else to rule over us. Um, in America, the first immigrants from India used it in order to upgrade themselves from the colored category to the white category, which some judges accepted, some didn't. But at any rate, many Indians tried. Um, then um, nationalists like Balagangadhara Tilak made their own version of it. Um, even uh, Savarkar accepted it, not because he was so enthusiastic about it, but you know he didn't feel like he could compete with the European scholars. They had a great prestige in India at the time. Um, and anyway, you see, from the Hindu nationalist viewpoint, it was not really important. Many nations have, as part of their national narrative, an immigration or a conquest. So it's not so important. Um, and, and today, in, in modern culture, origin is not important anymore at all. You see, in the Bible or in the Puranas, you have all these genealogies all these very, very long tables of this man beget this man and so on. And today this looks quaint. You know, in the Middle Ages, people were worked up about, oh, yeah, yeah, my ancestor was present in the conquest of Jerusalem by the Crusaders or something. You see today, well, you know, maybe your grandfather was something. That doesn't mean you are something. Um, I mean, there are so many... Uh, known histories of royal houses where some bride king then becomes the father of someone who proves useless. So this doesn't matter anymore. And that's incidentally one reason why many Western Indo-Europeanists find it bizarre that in India people are so worked up about this homeland question. Because you see in the West nobody cares anymore. In the 19th century, yes, the, the homeland thing was a big thing. Now, not anymore. And so that it is still in India, that's not understood. And so that's mainly because they don't understand the political uses that are made of the Aryan theory here by the Dravidianists, by the Ambedkarites, by the Christian missionaries. And so it is because of their Aryan agitation that Hindu nationalists are forced to react. And so that movement sympathizes, it has not concocted or invented, but it sympathizes with the emerging uh, out of India theory. Um, there used to be a real debate around the year 2000. Um, that was not final, not definitive, but anyway, that has been abandoned. And indeed, uh, yeah, one reason is that some Hindus, well, uh, let's say, didn't really uh, make good publicity for their case and made bad mistakes. And so they became the butt of ridicule. And uh, so here I think of, for instance, N.S. Raja Ram, uh, who, who did some very productive things, like uh, he showed how the theorem of Pythagoras actually comes from India. But um, in assessing where we are in the Aryan debate, he made a complete mistake. He claimed that the debate was over, that nobody believes in the Aryan invasion anymore, which is simply not true. Um, then under his influence, Hindu parents in California wanted to reform the textbooks. And so next to a number of very sensible edits, they also proposed to uh, put into these textbooks that there used to be an Aryan invasion theory, but that has been abandoned. Nobody believes in it anymore, which is simply not true, and which has attracted the attention of the other camp. And so they completely lost this case. 
So um, then uh, nobody wanted to have anything to do with this anymore. There was one book by Edwin Bryant and Laurie Patton. They edited a collection of papers for and against the Aryan invasion theory. That's the only case ever where the two theories really met at a scholarly level. But in her review of this book, Stephanie Jamieson, who is the latest translator of the Rig Veda, 2014, uh, there she wrote, 2005, the parallels between the intelligent design issue, which means Christian creationism, and the Indo-Aryan controversy are distressingly close. The Indo-Aryan controversy is a manufactured one with a non-scholarly agenda, and the tactics of its manufacturers, that's us, uh, are very close to those of the intelligent design proponents mentioned above. However unwittingly, and however high their aims, the two editors have sought to put a gloss of intellectual legitimacy on this uh, out of India theory, with a sense that real scientific questions are being debated in what is essentially a religio-nationalistic attack on a scholarly consensus. Now, if you read this properly and you know something about this issue, you can see that this is flatly untrue. The out of India theory has, of course, never posited a supernatural or anyhow counter scientific intervention. And uh, a number of scholars uh, involved, such as myself, have no national or religious dog in this fight. I am neither a nationalist nor a Hindu. And so yes, it started with people like the American archaeologist Jim Sheffer. Um, then uh, people like Michel Dalmino, for example. Um, so this is flatly untrue. It is also untrue among those who are Hindu nationalists. Like Sri Kantalagiri very candidly says, no, I have nothing to do with the RSS. However, I am very much a Hindu nationalist. And yet, you see, his arguments in favor of the out of India theory have nothing Hindu and nothing nationalist about them. They're very objective. Also, you have to see in history, the out of India theory is not some creation of Hindu nationalists. The Hindu nationalist movement did not exist in 1767, when the uh, Indo-European theory started, and when for 70 years the out of India scenario was the dominant one among not Indians, but among European scholars and the European uh, general public. And so debates about homelands, you see there have been many, you see, India is not the only alternative to the, uh, to the uh, Yamnaya homeland. Like in the 1990s, you strongly had the Anatolian homeland theory. That was found wrong. But nevertheless, as long as it lasted, it was taken seriously. And this also deserves to be taken seriously. And there are many uh, arguments in favor of it that don't take any technical knowledge, merely common sense. Like, for example, India then, as well as now, was a demographic powerhouse. This means, you see, if a small group, you know, a band of young, you know, horse-born uh, raiders come into India, they are totally insignificant. They may conquer a city or so, they may take some local women and procreate with them, but those women are going to raise the children in the native language and the invader's language is going to disappear. That's what's happened to the biggest empire in history of the Mongols. They conquered an enormously large part of the Eurasian landmass and yet they completely disappeared. 
you know, only uh, Kalmukia in the Russian Federation. That's a little thinly populated country that was Mongolized. But uh, otherwise, nothing, uh, absolutely nothing. Um, so by contrast, you have the native Indians who are very numerous, as well as very culturally and technologically advanced. So what happens if some political or climatic uh, ecological crisis happens in India? OK, some people are going to seek greener pastures. So if 1% of the Indian population emigrates, immediately in Central Asia, this is like 50% of the population, far more capable of transmitting their language. So you see, this anybody can understand this. You don't have to be a professor in linguistics for this. And yet it is linguistically a very relevant piece of information. Now, you see, the atmosphere was really poisoned by this comment of hers. And you find after that the situation that several scholars who, in spite of themselves, had provided arguments for the out of India theory, feel compelled to withdraw their case. Like you have Joanna Nichols, um, who has argued that all the Indo-European loan words that exist in Mesopotamian languages point to an origin in the Northeast, which is Afghanistan, back to here, which is the gateway to India. So they may have come out from India. Um, so you see, recently she, she published her paper in which she argued this in 1997. She republished this on the academia.edu site um, and she pre, uh, prefixed it with uh, a note saying that, yeah, you see, it's a beautiful theory. I stand by it. But it must not imply that India was the homeland. So you see, her theory is still correct. But the implications of the theory, shut up about that. The same thing happened with. Um, Klaus-Peter Zoller, who in the late 80s discovered Proto-Bangani. This is the substrate of a Hindi dialect somewhere in, in the Himalaya. And uh, so there he found a number of words that belong to the westernmost branches of Indo-European. So this supports, I don't say it necessitates, but it certainly indicates that these westernmost languages have a history inside India. So he similarly disowned his pro-out of India implications of his own findings, which he did not disown, and which have been confirmed by a number of different people, like this top linguist Hans Heinrich Hock, or in India, the uh, anthropologist specialist of tribal languages, uh, Anvita Abhi. Uh, so you see, this, this evidence is very serious. It really implies out of India. Yet, you see, they feel forced to take a distance from that. Now, why is there this veto on the out of India theory? So you see, some people in India shout, ah, racism. You see, I can assure you that it's not racism. I know my society. Nobody there would openly take a racist position. Maybe they think so secretly. They certainly won't say it. And they can give enough non-racist or even anti-racist reasons. Anti-racist because Hindus are the whites of India. You see, that which counts against the white majority in America counts against the Hindu majority in India. But you see, there are other reasons. Um, uh, just uh, generally, you see, clinging to the familiar. You know, there is always a resistance against something new. Uh, this even has a certain value. You see, if you have an existing theory, a paradigm, you should not give in too easily to challenges. You know, it should be robust. You know, it should be defended against new challenges. And then the challenges have to win through. 
when they really prove their point, now then they can be accepted. So in that sense, it is normal. You see, we, out of India, theorists should accept, yeah, we will really have to prove our point. We will have to take it to their camp and make them see. Then, of course, there is the demonization of the out of India theory as Hindu nationalist, which is not correct, but, you know, start to explain that. You know, even, even the supposed specialists of Hindu nationalism in the West get things hopelessly wrong. And so, you know, with outsiders like these linguists, you know, what do you expect? Uh, so this is all second-hand knowledge. You know, everybody warns them against Hindu nationalism, demonizes Hindu nationalism. So they don't know any better than that this is the story. And there is hearsay, you see, they don't know anything about the out of India theory. And, and this is very important. You see, the works of Sri Kantalagiri, for example, they are quite unknown in those circles. So the, the real, you see, the strong version of the out of India theory is just not known. So as a parting shot, I would advise you, first of all, both Indians and, and Westerners, to familiarize yourself with the full uh, out of India theory as it has been formulated by uh, Sri Kantalagiri. So you see, he shows that there is plenty of literary evidence. You see, from from pottery that is discovered by archaeologists, or from you see linguistic. Uh, consonant shifts or whatever that is discovered by linguists or genomes that are discovered by geneticists, that's all indirect evidence. You may deduce something from that, but it's all not very certain. Here you have a human testimony put into human words in a language that we can read. And you see there it goes into great detail. It says all kinds of things that archaeological uh, or, or linguistic discoveries never could. So you see, he shows in detail how, for example, the successive layers of the Rig Veda show a geographical gradient from east to west, whereas the Aryan invasion theory would presuppose a movement from west to east. Um, then how different emigrations, emigrations from India are remembered in the Rig Veda. You see, they reminisce about a pre-Vedic emigration by the Druhyu tribe, who are defeated by the Pauravas and the Anavas. Then later they describe the war between the Pauravas and the Anavas, which the Anavas lose, and they then also move to the northwest. So you see, that's a far better, far more detailed evidence than any of the other disciplines can muster. And so there you get a full account of the out of India theory. So I really hope everybody familiarizes himself with this and any arguments can follow after that. Thank you. <laughs>